this is our sixth class and uh, as per the queries discussed in the previous class uh, there was this question 9 of assignment 4 that was expressed as a critical question by somebody right yeah, yes madam yes uh, yes okay so uh, we will be having an extensive discussion on this topic and then we will go ahead with uh, the next topic for today okay so coming to the question, uh, this is the Bayesian network that has been provided to you. And on this basis, you are supposed to compute what is the probability that it is disease one. And this data has been provided to you. So we will simply take this uh, arrangement. This is just a, a schematic of this, uh, this problem statement. So uh, given that uh, this diagnosis is for disease one and disease two, we will assume that D1 union D2 is our whole universal set. I will repeat this part again. Considering that this is our given network, we have to build a figurative representation of that. And we map this out, this schematic, wherein this circle, yellow circle, represents D1. And this circle, blue circle, represents D2 enclosed within the whole universal set. Now you've been given data of D1 and D2, but there is a whole universal set. So now from the set theory, we will just demarcate different zones such that you understand what each terminology represents. Okay, so what is this circle? Everything apart from D1? No, no. the circle is D1. Okay. And this red portion, what is highlighted in red, is everything apart from D1. That means it is D1 dash. This is the representation. D1 dash represents everything in the universal set except D1. So if P of D1 is the probability of D1, then P of D1 bar is 1 minus P of D1. So far, so good? Yes, ma'am. And similarly, if this is my D2, then D2 bar or D2 dash represents everything in the universal set apart from D2. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about this? It is intersection of both events. So, intersection of D1 and D2. So, this Correct. zone belongs to both the sets, D1 as well as D2. And in set theory, we represent this as D1 intersection D2. What about this? Everything minus D1. Okay, this is your D1, right? Yeah. So everything minus D1, everything is this universal set. And when you subtract this circle from this universal set, you are left with this highlighted region, right? Yeah. So U minus D1, okay. Where U represents universal set. Okay, go on. What about this? D2 minus intersection of D1 and D2. Okay. Just the that part of D2, part of which doesn't include D1. Exactly. So this portion is the D1 intersection D2. And this whole circle is D2. So when I subtract from this D2, this intersection, then whatever is the remaining part is this highlighted part. So there are two representations of the same region. Relatable? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So similarly, here also, this part is U minus D2, or you could write it as D1 minus the common portion of D1 and D2. Do you know what is Bayes' theorem? Yes, sir. It's a conditional uh, probability. Conditional probability, right. So going by the Bayes' theorem, consider that you have the data, the entire data. Do not go by the limitation of this question. Consider that you have all the conditional probability data. In that case, the probability of D1 would be the conditional probability of D1 provided S1 multiplied by probability of S1 plus D1 provided S2 multiplied by probability of S2 and similarly plus D1 provided S3 multiplied by the probability of S3. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, will it be possible for you to type or write it just uh, to make it easier to follow? P of S1 
is equal to p of s1 provided d1 multiplied by probability of d1 plus p of s1 provided d2 multiplied by probability of d2 plus p of s1 provided d3 multiplied by probability of d3 till whatever completes your universal set yes, okay yes how would you represent the probability of s1 p of s1 given d1 mm -hmm. multiplied by p of uh, d1 given exactly Plus, plus p of plus. s1 not d1 multiplied by p of not d1 exactly so that is what this represents okay and why do you choose to do this because you do not know the entire universal set but you do know that d1 dash represents everything apart from d1 yes yes so this will d1 plus d1 dash will cover the whole universal set and that is essentially what you require right yes ma'am so if this would have been the question where it would have been shown that you know d1 union d2 is your universal set in that case you could very well replace d1 dash with d2 because both of these form the universal set but since that is not the case our question does not guarantee that uh, if you use d2 here then you will not have an additional term or you will not have any coincidence that is why for the safe side we will take d1 and excluding d1 whatever is the portion d1 dash similarly we could do d2 and excluding the portion of d2 d2 dash that could still give you the whole answer but now the limitation is that your question has this data only so considering that you have to substitute this formulation and there you go for the answer uh, ma'am one thing uh, i got this approach uh, but if suppose we were uh, told to uh, ask a, a probability of symptom s2 uh, not uh, s1 so in that case it will be a probability of s2 given d1 into probability of d1 plus probability of s2 given d2 into probability of d2 no you could very well do this uh, for d1 dash as well it does not necessarily mean that uh, you have to put it just for s1 the same scenario is for s2 as well as s3 okay. you could you could compute the probability of s2 provided d1 multiplied by probability of d1 plus probability of s2 divided by d1 dash multiplied by probability of d1 dash and that could very well give you the answer okay okay i yeah. asked because both we are having two incoming nodes that's why i thought okay it doesn't it won't matter okay okay see understand this network you have one node here and two incoming nodes here that would not make a difference on the computing of conditional probability so essentially whatever your network is if you have to compute then you have to simply add it all up the conditional probability for all the given scenarios nothing else now all the given scenarios means the entire universal set so if you do not have the data for the entire universal set then you have to take one minus subtraction of whatever data you have for example if you have the data for d1 then the remaining part of universal set is one minus probability of d1 so you have to go for that again i will reiterate consider that this is your given bayesian network and your this question has some limited amount of data so for now just ignore that you have this limited amount of data understand that you have all sorts of data probability of d1 probability of d2 probability of s1 probability of s2 s3 everything you have all the conditional probabilities also you have so in that case if you want to relate how is it related so if you have to compute the uh, probability of s1 and you have to use this conditional probability then probability of s1 given d1 multiplied by probability of d1 plus uh, probability of s1 given d2 multiplied by probability of d2 plus probability of s1 given d3 multiplied by probability of d3 and so on and so forth this will continue till your entire universal set is covered or alternatively what you could do is take probability of s1 given d1 
multiplied by D1 plus probability of S1 given D1 dash multiplied by probability of D1 dash. So D1 and D1 dash includes the entire universal set. So the entire universal set is covered. Yeah, understood. Fully understood. Thank you. Right. So that goes well for S1. That goes well for S2. That goes well for S3. And as many number of leaf nodes that you can see here. So probability of S1 could be represented in terms of the entire universal set. If I have to write, then from the given data, I could represent it in this form or this form. Both works fine. But considering the given data that I have, using this constraint, I see that I have all the values for this formula, but I do not have all the values for this formula. So I will simply substitute here and obtain the result. And if you substitute here, you will see that your result is 0.5. Yes. Um, uh, one more question if it is if you find it relevant uh, if suppose we are not given probability of d2 and we are told to find is it something that we can do from this see in this first formula you don't need to have the probability of d2 actually no no i am not asking about this question directly i am only talking about the figure i mean the bayesian graph and here in the data set we are given probability of d2 we consider that we are not given and we are given remaining details. Mm -hmm. uh, can we f figure out the probability of D2? I mean, if if suppose a question gets changed by using the same Bayesian network. So you, uh, uh, let me understand your question. You are asking mm -hmm. that this Bayesian network remains the same. Yes. And this question also remains the same. And only this probability of D2 is omitted from here. Yes. So uh, would the answer still change? This is your no, question. No my question is can we calculate like here we are calculating probability of the child i mean the one that are getting uh, the edges mm -hmm. the incoming edges mm -hmm. can we calculate the probability of the parent node as well uh for the parent node you need the conditional data for the leaf node for the leaf node you need the conditional probability data for the parent node condition has to be there for either sides so if D1 and D1 dash data is necessitated for S1, then for D1, S1, S2, S3 conditional data is requisite, prerequisite. Okay. Okay. D2 data is redundant there. Okay. Even here it is redundant actually. Because at times in the assignment there was a question where the information was being given but the answer came out that the details were not sufficient enough to calculate so that's what i wanted to understand that what all things you look for while seeing that okay uh maybe you could pinpoint that uh, question and i could maybe have an elaborate discussion on that in the next session definitely okay so this question the doubts are clear right is there any doubt here no doubt it is clear okay. no ma'am no ma'am okay so we will move forth and yeah this is our topic for today, decision trees. So, uh, have you gone through the basics of decision trees? It is binary. A sample. Exactly, yeah. this is binary, but why would you call it so? Because each node has got two outgoing edges. Exactly. Each node has got two outgoing edges. So, basically, you will have option of yes or no. The convention is the left node represents yes or true uh, or the value 1. And right node represents false or no or the value zero in binary. So uh, that is essentially the convention. So decision trees basically are elaborate network of binary classification statements such that you basically arrive at a specific conclusion. So the top of the decision tree is called the root node or simply root. These are called as internal nodes or branches and these are called as leaf nodes which further do not bifurcate into more nodes the end nodes they are called as leaf nodes so the nomenclature is clear right yes yes, yes. okay so with this we move forth towards an example for a better understanding of decision trees now consider that this data has been given to you if this data is given to you, I want to know which 
uh, column would be more efficient to compute whether the person is an art student or not? Movie lovers. Why would you say that? Because the value of movie lovers and art student is uh, more similar. Expecting one column, one row. The value of a movie lover and art student is more similar. And how do you assess that similarity? Yes, no match. Compared to book lover. And what about age? Uh, we didn't pay attention to that one, but... Uh... Yeah, so you are basically comparing these two. And from an eye estimation, you are predicting that since this matches better with this, so probably this is a better classifier as compared to this one. So weightage yeah. to, should be given more to this column. This From right. these two comparisons you are assessing, right? Right. Okay. So basically this tendency that you are assessing will be put forth in the form of a formulation, an elaborate formulation that will, in a numerical sense, give you this idea. Because this is a very small amount of data, so you are very easily computing this. But if you were to assess for a large amount of complicated data, wherein you have maybe multiple features, not just three, you may have uh, 30 or 300 features. In that case, handling this data becomes very tedious. So in that case, you need a numerical value to basically optimize which and where should form my uh, root node and which category should form my intermediate nodes and which category will fall in the leaf node. Leaf node as such is your outcome. So it is basically this one is your leaf node. But rest all you have to decide. So which one comes first, which one comes second, and how do you keep on classifying? So basically, if you if you go about making a decision tree, you can have infinite varieties of decision trees to classify whether the person is book lover and again classify whether the uh, person is a movie lover and again classify what is the age group of that person and so on and so forth. And this uh, decision tree could continue till you finally reach a point where you could uh, finally state for sure whether or not that person is uh, an art student or not. But the most elaborate decision tree has to be figured out which in the minimum number of steps would compute your result or outcome. So that essentially requires you to compute what is the efficiency of each of these feature vectors. The problem statement is clear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now let us consider the case of book lover, this feature. As per convention, left wedge represents yes, while right wedge represents no. no. Right? So if the person is a book lover, then how many of them are art student and how many of them are not art student? So if the person is a book lover, yes. Art student, no. So I count it as one here. Again, yes. And this is also no. So I'll count it as two. Again, yes. And this is yes. So I count one here. And again, yes. And here, answer is no. So I count three here. So eventually, you get one yes, art student, which is this case. And three no, not art student for this, this, and this case. This part is clear? Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Now consider the case of not a book lover. You have three population of non-book lovers. And amongst them, two are art student, while one is not. So your data set becomes like this. So this representation is clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now the same thing we will do for movie lover. We get this. So till here you agree with me, right? Okay. Now understand that these three nodes, you will not be able to confidently say whether or not that person belonging to this category is an art student or not. But this node you will be able to confidently say that if the person is not a movie lover, then he is definitely not an art student. Yes, because there is no. There is no data set which falls in this category, this subcategory. This is certain, no? That's right. This is certain. While these three are not so certain, there is still some possibility. That's so, right. such nodes which have this combination of this kind of data, they are called as impure nodes. 
while such nodes which do not have any combination of data have a clear distinction zero and some value here or maybe some value here and zero so this kind of node is called pure node so you understand what is pure and impure right yes okay uh, one where we have clearly a uh, demarcated thing like we uh, there is no uh, issue in understanding i mean there is nothing which is 50 50 or 60 40 exactly in, there is so no probability is associated with it yeah. it is It's binary certain certainty so basically it is either zero or one binary so in that case what happens is this forms your leaf node such pure nodes essentially you don't need further bifurcation so wherever your this part comes your decision tree ends this part here you will be able to give a confident decision so once you are able to give a confident decision your decision tree is over there so that leaf node basically ends it whereas these three still have some doubt so basically there may be further bifurcations here so you may have to draw another wedges to ask further questions to further classify right so you understand what is impure and what is pure right <clears throat> yes we are clear on this okay so if that is clear then we move ahead and yes the purity there may be some numeric value associated with it right you will be able to quantify how much pure it is for example if you uh, you, you have a decision tree which does not just get over there are bifurcations and it goes on and on so you can't continue that infinite loop right so you have to stop somewhere so where will you stop where you have an acceptable level of purity or acceptable level of impurity there you stop your loop and you say that okay even if this is 99% sure of or even if it is 99.99% sure then also i can say that okay uh, this is my final decision so how would you quantify this kind of purity or impurity this term how you quantify your impurity is called gini impurity so for a feature you will be able to quantify the term gini impurity so for example if we consider this this feature book lover so we have two leaves two nodes under it so for these two nodes first we compute what are the gini impurities and we will take a weighted average for these two to compute the total gini impurity for this feature so this we will uh, do this exercise for each of these so you have a better understanding of that for now i would like to give you a heads up that apart from this terminology gini impurity there are other alternatives like information gain and entropy that can also give you an idea regarding this but for now understand that gini impurity is a good magnitude of uh, the level of impurity that your node represents so what is the formula essentially gini impurity for a leaf would be 1 minus the probability of yes squared minus the probability of no squared so for this leaf the probability of yes is 1 divided by total 1 plus 3 that is 1 by 4 and the probability of no is 3 divided by 1 plus 3 that is 3 by 4 and your gini impurity becomes 0.375 yeah so similarly we will try this for this leaf node this leaf node is represented if the person is a book lover that is yes now this node represents if the person is not a book lover so if the person is not a book lover this is your data set and essentially this is your gini impurity for this leaf node you have calculated yes, calculated gini impurity for the other node for the book lover no no yes so i calculated the gini impurity for not a book lover case for this node this is the gini impurity yes ma'am Okay. it is the possible outcome divided by total number of outcomes exactly so you have the gini impurity for this node and you have the gini impurity for this node so now it is possible for you to compute the gini impurity for this whole feature taking the weighted average now understand that the population of this and this is not same right here the population is 4 while here the population is 3 so the weighted average 
will give you the exact value of Gini impurity here. Had it been 50-50, here also 4 or here also 4, or maybe here also 3, here also 3, in that case, the Gini impurity would simply be an average of that because the weighted average and average would be same in that case. But if the population is not equal, in that case, you should compute the weighted average. Yes, ma'am. It is clear. Yeah. The total Gini impurity for this node is the weighted average of its leaf nodes. And what is it? It is basically 4 divided by total population 7. 4 belongs to this. Total population is 7, which is the weight of this node multiplied by the Gini impurity of this node, which is 0.375 plus 3, which is the weight of this node, divided by 4 plus 3, which is the population of this whole, multiplied by the Gini impurity of this node. So eventually, what is the answer that you get? 0 0.405. So the Gini impurity for this feature, this root node, is 0.405. This part is clear, right? Yes, ma'am. It is clear. Okay. Then, similarly, we can compute the Gini impurity for this note as well. For that, we will have a similar exercise. We will compute for this first, this second, and take the weighted average, and then you get a value for this as well. So that can be done, right? Yes, ma'am. We know it now. Yeah, okay. similar way. So, I mean... eventually, if you note down the Gini impurity value for this, this is 0 0.405, and for this, you will get 0 0.214. So, which one is more impure now? Book lover node is impure. Book lover. Book lover is more impure now. While movie lover is more pure now. And you have a quantity associated with it. You can quantify basically how pure it is or how impure it is. Right? So, amongst book lover and amongst movie lover, if I have to choose which node to put at the top or which feature to put at the top for deciding my tree, then... I would rather go for movie lover because it is more pure. This gives me a faster decision, right? But uh, we didn't uh, evaluate uh, the nodal gene impurity of age. Yeah, we are supposed to do, do that further. For now, I am just comparing book lover and movie lover. My statement was amongst book lover and movie lover, if I have to compare, in that case, I would like to put movie lover on the top. Because it is more pure. As compared to your book lover, this feature. When I am comparing only these two. Now for age, it, it requires a separate exercise. Why? Because this was having a binary statement. Whereas this is numeric. So this numeric needs to be converted to binary to put it in this form. So how can you do that? What you do is you take the average values of each of the classes. So 7 and 12, the average is 9.5. 12 and 18, average is 15, so on and so forth. You take the averages and now you can classify whether less than 9.5 or greater than 9.5. Another way is less than 15 or greater than 15. Another class is less than 26, uh, sorry, 26.5 or more than 26.5 and so on and so forth. So now you have binary classifiers, right? Yes, ma'am. So now that you have these binary classifiers, for each of these classifiers, consider that this is your uh, book lover, this is your movie lover, this is your food lover, and so on and so forth. There are so many categories. So you would have computed ideally for all of these, the Gini impurity, considering them as the no root nodes. Now consider these categories as the root nodes. Less than 9.5, yes or no. Less than 15, yes or no. Less than 26.5, yes or no. And so on and so forth. So these nodes you have now. And for all of these cases, you compute the Gini impurity. Now it is binary, right? Uh, madam, uh, you have taken um, some value as a threshold mm -hmm. and everything less than that threshold is uh, uh, no and everything greater than that threshold is yes. That is how you have calculated. Uh, how you have taken 9.1, 9.5, okay, which is average of uh, 7 and 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything, every value, uh, that is lesser than 9.5 9 centered as no and everything greater than 9.5 is centered as yes. No, not essentially. The classification is you have a root node age less than 9.5. The left arrow represents yes, the right arrow represents no. So the left arrow represents yes, falls in this category. 
So age less than 9.5 is one no. And age less than 9.5 no category has one no, one yes, second yes, third yes, second no, third no. So three no's and three yes. Remember this classification. Yes and no counts you are doing, right? Under this category. So if this category is age less than 9.5, then you would have one no here and zero yes. And here age greater than 9.5 category falls and you have three yes here and three no here. Okay. So you understand that this is not thresholding as such, you know, everything apart from uh, this category is not yes because it depends on what is this data. See, everything greater than 9.5 falls in this data category. Except this first row, everything greater than 9.5 is here. In the case of 15, you have two data sets here, less than 15, and five data sets greater than 15. Got it. Got it. Uh, Sonia, ma'am, or 26, 18, it is showing yes, although it is a, a lower value than 26.5. No, no, no. This is your data set. But when you, when you are classifying now. So when you are classifying, classifying. So now you have taken these average values. Now these average values will act as different classifiers, different features. So basically this one feature age, this column, you have made it into multiple columns. And now instead of one feature, this age, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six columns, six features. Just like two features, movie lover and book lover, you also have six more features which represent this whole numerical data. The average value, each average will, uh, value will act as a leaf uh, root or note, right? It yeah, will act as yeah, right, right. Each average will act as a root node. Essentially, this exercise I am doing because I want to make it into a binary classifier. If it is not less, then eventually it is more, right? So it is binary. Either it is less than 9.5 or it is more than 9.5. Either it is less than 15 or it is more than 15. Either it is less than 26.5 or it is more than 26.5. That way, I will be able to count the data. What okay? is the reason of taking an average? Uh, I mean, there could be... Uh, you could you could very well go with a, uh, any arbitrary value in between. Can you take a median value of all the data points? instead of averaging of two. Uh, can you take my uh, median value of these all data, data set? By middle value, you mean the average, right? The median, median value. Median value. Any median value or any numeric value that you get, uh, that will essentially lie in any of the domains. For example, uh, say suppose your median value comes out to be 33. So if you choose 33 also in place of 26.5, essentially the counts remain the same. Basically, this arrangement and this arrangement do not change. And this arrangement and this arrangement alone is responsible for computing the Gini impurity value. It does not matter what is uh, the value in between that you take. For example, uh, I, would, I would rather go by the numeric uh, instance for you to be able to understand. Okay, so let us uh, take 15. And then we will take 17, okay? Both of the, those values lie here in this domain. So we will take age less than 15 first and then compute what is the Gini impurity. And again, we will do the same exercise, taking age less than 17 and do the same exercise. So you will be able to better relate what I'm trying to say here. Now, if the age is less than 15, what do you get the outcome? How many yes and how many no for being an art student? Two, two no and two six no. and five no, yes. Uh, if no the age yes. is less than 15, that is, here I have age less than 15 and I'm talking of yes, age is less than 15, this no. In that case, you have two data sets and both are no. So basically you have two no and zero yes for age less than 15, right? Now consider age less than 17. 
How many yes and how many no for art lover? Two no and zero yes. Two no and zero yes. It's the same, right? Yes. It's the same. Now, what about age greater than fifteen? So, if my category here was age less than fifteen, then I am talking of no. Age is not less than fifteen. So, I am talking of this note. So, age not less than fifteen. That means age greater than fifteen, which counts these. How many are yes, art student, and how many are no, not art student? Three yes and two no. Three yes and two no. Now consider my demarcation instead of fifteen is seventeen. What is the count of yes, art student, and no, not art student? Same thing. Okay. Same thing. It's the same count as for the demarcation of fifteen. So it is immaterial where you take the demarcation. the counts will not change so basically a simple averaging will be able to take all the demarcations into account okay yes ma'am yes, ma so in that case even if you go for a median value any value which is a median will fall in some of these categories and essentially that will not alter the counts so basically all the categories are well covered when you take any any value in between all of these categories yes ma'am okay so if this part is clear then now we have the gini impurity for all the age classes and from all the age classes the impurity is least in these two cases so we could go for either of them because these are equal we could go for either of them age less than 15 yes or no or age less than 44 yes or no both work fine yes ma'am Okay. You have to again compare this with the previous. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Now you have to compare this with the previous because now you have classes book lover, movie lover, and for age you have classes this and this, or maybe either. So amongst these three, if I compare, then point four zero five, point two one four, and point three four three. Which one do you find as the least? Movie lover is the least. Movie lover is the least. So this goes on top. This will be able to shorten my decision tree. uh it will hasten the process of your decision and it will give you a quick decision of uh whether that person may be an arts student or not for instance here only i can see one leaf node forming and this one i will further bifurcate and maybe decide further hello ma'am yes can we take a three edge means uh, in edge we can take a, a less than 15 and 15 to 14 for and no, no, uh, greater than that. 44 you can't do that because uh, when you are taking three arrows then it is no more binary okay it has to be binary it has to be transformed such that it it can have just binary yes and so that is why we will okay. choose uh, such classes which can only exist in binary yes okay so now this is clear that we have this movie lover now this is a pure node so this gives a decision we are not further bifurcating it Uh, rather we cannot further bifurcate it and here we will have further bifurcations but now the study will be amongst these four classes only so we will ignore all those which are addressed here so basically now our table will include certain rows only not this whole data set only certain rows which are yes movie lovers because yes movie lovers is the node that is further to be bifurcated not a movie lover is not to be bifurcated so our population is not the entire data set now it is the population of only yes movie lovers so our data set is yes this first row third row fourth row and fifth row yes we are on the left side of the tree you are on the left side of the tree and amongst this now you have to classify whether you will uh further decide on the basis of book lover or age now you have to change your data set and ignore these data sets for no movie lover and amongst that data set you have to repeat the same exercise to compute the gene impurity yes we can do that so once you do that you will find that the gene impurity values for book lover is 0.25 and for age less than 12.5 is zero so again we come about to two pure nodes here these are fully decisive 
and here one pure node and here one impure node. Right. So basically you don't have to ask any further question here, here and here, but here you may further need to bifurcate on the basis of age and this bifurcation would finally give you a decision in this case also. Uh, yes, Madam, one doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, if we come to the the leftmost leaf node, mm -hmm. where uh, you have one uh, art student as yes and uh, one art student no as one, mm -hmm. what is the decision here in this case? You cannot decide. That is why you need further bifurcation. That is why there will be a third level. So this is your first level, whether okay. a movie lover or not. Second level, there are two, whether a book lover or not, and whether your age is less than 12.5 or not. This okay. is on the second level. And in the second level here on the right node, you don't need further bifurcations because these are pure. Otherwise, you could have further bifurcations here if they were impure. And here on the right node, you do not have a bifurcation again. But in the left node, since it is indecisive, you further need bifurcations. That falls in the third level. See, this is your movie lover is your first decisive note right because the Gini impurity is the lowest here but now if you compute the Gini impurity for book lover and age less than 12.5 then you see that the Gini impurity is lowest in the case of age which is less than 12.5 so which which classification would you consider we will consider age you will consider age why this is because uh, the Gini impurity Index. is the lowest here lowest one right so amongst this, you will ask the second question if the age is less than 12.5. You will not ask this question. This bifurcation, see, you have to decide what is the next question to ask. That is what is your decision tree. So first question you ask whether the person is a movie lover. If yes, then you count it here. If no, you count it here. And now when you count it here, you get four. And when you count it here, you get three. Now amongst those three, you count how many are art student and how many are not art student. And here also amongst those four, you count how many are art student and how many are not art student. If here you will be able to give with certainty that whether that person is an art student or not, then your decision is reached. So you stop it here. If here you are not able to give with certainty whether that person is an art student or not, you need to ask another question. Now that another question you have to choose which feature to rely on to give a quick decision. So now you compute on the remaining features. So since you asked already about movie lover, now the next question is whether or not that person is a book lover. And like I said, you will have to count for the remaining four in the population. Movie lover, yes, is this, 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 and this. So age less than 12.5 or not, age less than 26.5 or not, age less than 37.5 or not so if you take these classes and you compute the Gini impurity for these three age classes and one book lover this class also this age class gives the lowest Gini impurity while if you compare book lover it is still having some value of the Gini impurity so uh, amongst all the values the lowest is Gini impurity equal to zero so which classifier would you like to choose Age. age. The one in so, age. in order to further bifurcate this node, you will go for asking the next question if the age is less than 12.5 or not. That would give you a better judgment of whether that person is an art student or not. There is no point of having this book lover. Exactly. Order. Exactly. That is, that is what I am saying. If you have to choose that amongst these, you have to now ask another question such that you can finally give an ardent decision whether or not that person is an art student then what is the next question that you're going to ask that depends on the Gini impurity of the remaining features you have already asked this question so this feature is not to be asked anymore it is immaterial now another question that you can ask is whether that person is a book lover whether that age is less than 12.5 whether the age is less than 26.5 whether the age is less than 36.5. These are the four questions that you can ask, right? Yes. So uh, asking these four questions 
you can basically compute the Gini impurity in each of the cases. And what is the Gini uh, impurity, the lowest value that you can have? Zero. Zero. And that you have in the case of? See, I have not listed the other two, but other two may or may not be zero. The lowest value is zero. So this works. Right. So if that is the case, then the next question from here you will ask is not about being a book lover. The next question you will ask is if the age is less than 12.5 or not. If so, then yes, how many? No, how many? And from here, you will be able to clearly give an identification. In the case of yes, you will be able to say that it is not an art student. If the age is more than yes, the person is an art student. And hence your decision. So how many levels are there? Two levels. Two levels, exactly. It is clear. Can we consider book lover as uh, a redundant feature? I mean, it is, of no use it is not. It is not a redundant feature. See, essentially, you can only compare Gini impurity when you have Gini impurity values for other features. If you do not have other features there, how can you compare? Here, okay. if suppose your value was not zero, say suppose, suppose 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 is the least value. So you would still go for this, right? Right. But you have to have something else to compare that this is lowest. So it can okay. be called redundant. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Is there any uh, consequences of covariance and co uh, correlation here? Correlation. Uh, correlation uh, will not affect your decision tree per se because they are not independent, right? But they are not going to affect your Gini impurity values because Gini impurity values are counted on the basis of population of your final decision, which is here. So, irrespective of that, your Gini impurity is independent of the correlation between the feature vectors. Uh, Gini index is one parameter to decide the purity and impurity of the nodes. Second is the entropy, right? It... Uh, yes, entropy is another. Uh, so, suppose that we are giving the depth of the decision as 4, mm -hmm. then uh, still it is uh, the machine is giving us the decision trains. How it is possible that if only there are, now in our case, there is only, there are only two levels, but if you are giving depth is equal to 4, it is giving us a decision tree of 4 level. How it is possible? What makes you think it is not possible? Because uh, the, if we are getting the pure nodes at the end, there is no any criteria, there is no further question to ask. Then how the decision tree for the four nodes, four levels will be created? If there are no any questions to ask, that means that you have already re reached to the saturation. You have already reached the decision. If, if, if you are putting an upper limit on the number of questions, it does not mean that you will not be able to decide in less number of questions. Uh, second question is ma'am, how the entropy will work if this is the case? Uh, okay, uh, entropy actually we will be discussing at length in the next session. So I will keep that reserved for that. But uh, on a preliminary level, let us come here. Yeah. When we started this exercise, I asked you that could you compare these features and uh, suggest that which was a more reliable feature and somebody said that movie lover tends to be a better classifier as compared to book lover uh, just from I estimation how how what what was the background of this thought there is no evidence no, because uh, we are just observing and telling such so kind of we are there should be thing. some basis of your observations it's not entirely random right what is that basis the maximum matches the maximum is. matches right yeah. how much resemblance is there or how closely fit it is as compared to the others that is what you are assessing right so basically you are assessing the entropy the back foot is entropy if you look at the formulation also the formulation goes very much in agreement to what your back thought is it is a logarithmic term associated with your probability, right? That is what your entropy is. We will discuss in the subsequent lectures, but your formulation essentially is dependent on the probability of your feature. And you are assessing how close that is to the final decision. So the back thought operative behind this psychology is nothing but entropy. How random your uh, data set is or how closely resembling your data set is either way around this is more random and therefore 
a less efficient classifier. This is more precise, less random, therefore a better classifier than book lover. When, when we started this question, this exercise, we did not know about Gini impurity. We could still say that movie lover is a better classifier compared to book lover. Just by assessing the resemblance, just by assessing the entropy. Yeah. Okay, so it's that is about concept that, intuition. Concept. Yes, so that is the crux of it. But then again, uh, there is a formulation associated with it. There is a derivation associated with it. So maybe we'll discuss that in the next class so that we can have an assessment of these parameters. But then again, you could use uh, either of these uh, formulations, be it uh, your IG or be it your uh, entropy or be it your uh, GI. Right, madam. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and happy Teacher's Day to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.